The church presents for us, for meditation this week, the readings in Genesis from 8, 9, 10, and 11, and the beginning of 12. This is the part of Genesis that tells us about the resolution of the flood and the call of Abram, or Abraham, as he's called later. As I mentioned in previous studies, these readings from Genesis and then eventually Exodus, along with the readings from Proverbs and Job and Isaiah, these were the books that were being used in the early church to educate the catechumens. This Lenten process in which we find ourselves now halfway through was a process of, of meditation, preparation, discernment in, uh, in approach in, the, the, uh, for, in preparation for the coming baptism of the catechumens 40 days later. Now, if I were to suggest to you to prepare some catechumens for baptism, where might you start? I think today many Christians would probably not begin in Genesis and Exodus, Proverbs, Job, Isaiah. But the early church thought differently than we modern Christians often do. They understood, as St. Athanasius the Great says, that what you must understand is this, that the same God created the world through the same word by which He saved it. St. Athanasius says, there is no difference between salvation and creation. For God saved the world by the same word by which He created it in the beginning. This is, of course, is John's point in his prologue. He begins to tell us the story of Jesus, beginning with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, And the Word was God, and through Him all things were created. You remember in Genesis, God says, let this be, and it comes to be. Right? He creates by His Word. The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, so that man, so that the creation that was created at the first through the Word of God, may be recreated or saved, restored to what it once was through the same Word. And so the church has us meditate this week in a very important passage, at least the beginning of this, with the resolution of the flood. We talked last week of how the flood is a prefigurement for baptism. I read for you last week from 1 Peter chapter 3 where Peter says that the flood corresponds to baptism. How so? Well, look what happens. The waters cover the earth You have a decreation. It's as if Genesis 1 has rewound. The waters cover the earth. There is water above, water below, and darkness. We just had a pretty serious storm late last night or this morning. You can maybe get some sense of it, right? So, the floodwaters have come on the earth and now the flood begins to resolve itself just like we saw in Genesis 1. God decides to save Noah. It says He remembered Noah in the ark. Now, why does it say He remembers? It doesn't mean that God forgot. But in the Bible, when God remembers, it's always a reference to a covenant He has made. So, in Genesis 8, when God remembers Noah and those with him in the ark. It's a reference back to chapter 7, wherein God had said, I will destroy the earth and remove the breath of life from all creatures, except I will make my covenant with you, Noah, and those with you in the ark. I will save you. When God binds himself to man, when God joins himself in a relationship, we call that covenant, Man is restored to life. God is the source of life. And so when God makes a covenant with man, man is restored in the Old Testament, at least to some degree, however minor, to the life he once had in the garden. This process climaxes, of course, with the covenant 
in Jesus Christ, or the covenant who is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the new covenant. He is that relationship, as St. Paul says in 1 Timothy, the God-man, right? He is the one mediator between God and man. He in Himself. So that those who are baptized into Christ are joined to the Father. We become, as St. Peter says in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 4, partakers of the divine nature. The flood is resolved by God sending His Spirit, the wind. In the English translations, you have wind coming and parting the waters of the flood. But in the Hebrew text, in the Greek text, in the Aramaic, and in the Latin, all of these following the Hebrew tell us that this is the Spirit. In Hebrew, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Ruach Elohim. In the Greek, Pnevma Tutheu, the Spirit of God. When you come to Genesis chapter 8, it's the same word in the Hebrew. God sent a wind, our English translations say. That's fine. Except that it you might not see the connection. The Hebrew text says ruach, which can be translated wind, but also spirit. In the Greek translation of the Hebrew, we call this the Septuagint, that the Jews had made 200 years before Christ to be used in their synagogues. They translate in both of these places the word ruach with the Greek word pnevma or pneuma, as you might hear it said. This is the word spirit in Greek, which can also mean wind. This is the same word we're going to see later on in Exodus when God sends a wind or the spirit to part the waters of the Red Sea so that dry land may appear and the new creation may go forth. You can see, hopefully, the parallelism to the creation story. The waters part. The, 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 the clouds are driven away by the wind. The storm stops. The sun comes out. The water, the water is parted. You can see Genesis 1 all over again. And in fact, in case you missed it, the author here reminds you that Noah is like a new Adam by telling you that God said to him, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply, God says. God made man and woman to be fruitful and multiply. This is part of his nature. And so, in chapter 8, we hear again the new Adam is told by God, this is Noah now, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There's the voice of the product of these kinds of things today. So, this is God's will for man. Life. We participate in God's gift of life. He allows us to be a tool, an instrument, through which life continues to spread throughout the earth. Right? We are made in God's image and likeness. And we're able, as with the rest of creation, to participate in some way in God's majesty, His glory, His power. Even the animals have the power to procreate. Right? God says to them to be fruitful and multiply. As St. Augustine says, the impression of the Trinity is on all of creation. As we continue in the story, we hear this new Adam, Noah, just like the Adam of old, had sons and daughters and lots of kids. And they had lots of kids. And they had lots of kids. We hear about three different families of the earth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three different families from which all the, world, the earth is people, it says. But God chooses one man out of that multitude. Abraham. Or Abram here. This is parallel from the previous cycle. You heard that Adam had sons. And all of these children, and some better than others. And one man was chosen. Noah through whom God would save humanity. 
though it was the covenantal Savior, the new Adam. And so Abram now is in the parallel cycle here. Abram is the new Adam or the new Noah through whom God will save mankind. You hear about all of these generations and generations coming from Noah. But one man is chosen. Abram. And let me read to you again the last words that we heard. This is chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who curses you I will curse and by you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you hear that? God's not a Calvinist. Do you hear that? All of humanity... It comes from Noah. All of the sons of Adam. God loves them. And He wants to save them. As St. Paul says in the New Testament, God desires that all men be saved. He desires this. Not all are willing. Not all are willing to accept His call, His grace. But God desires that all men be saved. No matter how old. No matter of what race, no matter how righteous, no matter how sinful, God desires that all men come into relationship with Him and find life. And so, these readings are presented to the catechumen and to us to understand our place, like the catechumens, in the story of salvation history. That verse is you. Chapter 12, verse 3. So that through you, Abram, all the nations may be blessed. How is that going to happen? How is God going to bring all of the nations, all of mankind, into the covenantal people of God, back into His family, back into covenantal relationship, back into the Garden of Eden. How is God going to do that? Through one man. A new Adam. A new Noah. A new Abram. His name is Jesus Christ. And this is why Matthew's Gospel begins with the words, the book of the genealogy of Jesus the Christ Son of David, son of Abraham. Abraham. Very good. Son of David, the Christ, these titles, we'll talk about them another time, but I want to focus in on those words. Son of Abraham. Well, of course he's the son of Abraham. There are no sons of David that are not sons of Abraham. In fact, all of those who have the title Christ in the Bible obviously are sons of Abraham. They must be the descendancy of David. All descendants of David are the sons of Abraham because all descendants of David are the tribe of Judah. And all members of the tribe of Judah are of the people of Israel who are descendants of Isaac, who are descendants of Abraham. Why does Matthew tell us this? To remind us of this text right here, which was one of the most important texts for the early church. When you look at the New Testament, you find an inordinate focus on a number of texts in the Old Testament. About five of them. One of them, if not the most important one, is Genesis 12, verse 3. Through you, through your seed, Abram, all the nations shall be blessed. As St. Paul says, seed is singular there. And that seed is Jesus Christ. And this is why at the end of Matthew's Gospel... He shows us how, through Jesus, all the nations shall be blessed. How Jesus is this son of Abram. Jesus says to his disciples, Go out and baptize all nations. All nations. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them all that I have taught you. And behold, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you to the ends of the earth. 
Glory be to Jesus Christ with His eternal Father and His all-holy and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. Amen.